World War in Germany, there was the Spartacist Revolution, a communist uprising. The uprising soon turns into a civil war, and in 1923, the communists, as happened in Russia, win. Germany becomes a Soviet Republic. The German leader is now Liebknecht. Then, communism spreads to other countries, causing tensions throughout the world. The breaking point arrives after the German invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1930. France and the United Kingdom declared war on the communist bloc. The two sides. In the communist bloc, we have the Soviet Union with its leader Trotsky, Germany, Italy in which Toyoti seized power in 1923, China, now communist after a brief civil war, Hungary, Bulgaria with its first secretary Dimitrov at the helm, and Slovakia. On the other side, the British Empire, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, France, headed by Philippe Pétain, rapidly followed by Japan, the United States are neutral. The Second World War has begun. It's capitalism versus communism. Let's start. Nineteen thirty. What are the forces on the field and the weapons? The tanks. The automotive industry is in its infancy, so tanks in nineteen thirty are quiet, troublesome equipment and not so important in the battlefield. A tank battalion that, after a hundred kilometers, lost most of its vehicles due to mechanical failure is not a reliable asset in combat. UK has, among other, the Vickers Medium Mark II and around 400 Cardon Loy tank kits. The French have thousands of Renault FT, used by other countries too, and other tanks as the heavy tank Char 2C. USA have 900 M1917, a copy of the French Renault FT. The Italians have the Fiat 3000. The Soviets have the T-18 tank. Without the restrictions of Versailles, the Germans developed their own tanks maybe a better version of the Leisch tractor, BK-31, and the predecessor of the Panzer I, a 5 tons tank, armed with an M13 machine gun, 7.92 mm, and an armor of 7 mm. The Balkan cruise could have been used by Volkswagen too. It had no political meanings. It was introduced in 1916 to improve the recognition. The aircraft in 1930 are mainly biplanes. Their importance is limited. Forgot the World War II carpet bombing of the cities. The French Air Force is the largest in the world. 2000 Brigitte 19 bomber. It could carry 470 kilograms of bombs. 2500 fighter bomber Potes 25. 300 Leo et Olivier 20. The fastest bomber in the world. UK has around 400 Bristol Bulldog fighters. USA have the fighters Boeing F-2B-1, the Curtis P-1 Hawk, the Boeing Model 15 that could be carrier-based and other types. The Italians have the CR-1 and the CR-20. Canada has a sizable fleet of Siskins aircraft. The Soviets have the Polikarpov, Po-2, the all-metal fighter Tupolev I-4, 200 Grigorovich I-2, and 300 Polikarpov I-3, a fighter. The backbone of the Soviet bomber force are 150 Tupolev TB-1. Without Versailles, the Germans would have their own air force, the Volksluftstreikkräfte, the Heinkel HD-37, the Junkers G-24, a bomber with a range of 2,000 kilometers and a payload of 1,000 kilograms. Erato R-64, a fighter, He-45, a light bomber. Germans, Italy and the Soviets have almost no navy. The scuttling of the German fleet in June 1919 in Skapoflow happens the same, and many of the ships remained are lost in the civil war. 
Due to infrastructure damage and shortage of resources, Germany will not build ships bigger than 10,000 tons, mostly limited to coastal defense and occasional raids on targets in the North Sea. Once again, the U-boats will have to do the heavy lifting. The Germans will develop a wide fleet of submarines, but the Allied with the British, French, Japanese and USA fleets has the absolute control over the seas. The most important assets in 1930 remain infantry and artillery. Germany at the start of the war mobilized 5 million men in the Volksfair. In this situation, Germany will mobilize earlier. Not in 1943 as Nazi Germany. The Soviets could muster up to 20 million men and an infinity of cannons, machine guns, mortars. And add their allied Italy, Hungary, China, Bulgaria. Nobody in history had such army. The French stay behind the Maginot Line, a series of fortifications between Switzerland and Belgium, and prepare to fight a long defensive war. They think the Maginot Line is impossible to break. Their plan is to stay there presumably for the next two or three years, during which they will complete the rearmament while weakening Germany and Italy with the naval blockade. In case of a German attack on Belgium, they will move westward to set up a defensive line away from France. They hope that after a few years of shortages and rationing, the German people would rise up as they did in 1918 and kick Liebknecht out. France neither rates the red military power very highly. They defeated Germany a few years before and Russia had collapsed during the First World War. They think the Bolshevik seized power only because they got lucky. The French are making a mistake. While indeed the Bolshevik were lucky and a communist German army would have been weaker than that of under Hitler, during World War I the French were barely able to hold on to the front against the Germans alone. Russia and Italy are now enemies. While no Russian units will be in the Western Front, the Germans have no threats in the East, a big advantage. During the 1918 retreat from France and Belgium, the German Imperial Army managed to evacuate most of the artillery to Germany. In our timeline, Germany had to destroy them according to the Versailles Treaty. But in this timeline, the Germans do not care about Versailles. So Germany in 1930 has more artillery guns than every other country in the world, except Russia. The skilled Prussian army generals such as Ludendorff, Falkenhayn, Guderian, Manstein and Rundstedt are mostly in the gulags or killed. But enough officers survive to keep tactical proficiency high. People like Walter Model, Ferdinand Schöner, Paulus, Höppner and Leib, who came from middle class families, continue their careers. Rommel II is in the Volkswehr. His regiment was involved in quelling riots during the German Civil War, but wherever possible, Rommel always avoided the use of force. Also, the Volkswehr is not as polluted by commissars as the Red Army, another good thing for fighting efficiency. Any miracle like the 1940 Battle of France aren't realistic here, but the Germans routinely destroyed the French army since 1870 without the need of an Einstein. Germany has a very large population compared to France and could rise up more than 10 million men. Add 2 million men that the Italians have in the southern front. French and British Expeditionary Corps can't even remotely match these numbers. There will be the usual invasion of Belgium and the Netherlands. Huge artillery bombardments followed by mass attacks from infantry and light tanks such as the Panzer 1. The Panzer 1 is very strong against infantry since western armies have no good anti-tank abilities. This war will also have less trenches. Then the Maginot Line would have been broken somewhere. The Maginot Line is a strong defensive line, but it is not the Great Wall of China. It has a lot of weak points. The fortresses are too widely spaced apart to prohibit passage between, few machine guns and it's far from complete. The Germans don't need to destroy the whole Maginot Line. They only have to smash a single point, let's say at Boulay, then pour through the gaps and bypass those strong points they couldn't quickly take, under the cover of heavy artillery bombardment and smoke shells. Now the German Rote Armee will rush towards Paris. After the crossing of the Marne, with no miracles this time, the French army collapses between tons of mutiny. 
This operation will be very costly for the Germans. Maybe 100,000 men, maybe 200,000, or even more. But it would have ended with a catastrophe for the French and a Dunkirk for the British. 29th of May, 1930. The Rote Army enters Paris. France surrenders. A People's Republic under Maurice Thore is proclaimed in Paris. The new republic declares its neutrality in this war, expropriates the large estates and tries to organize workers' councils in its industry. Belgium and the Netherlands follow the same path. Luxembourg becomes one of the Soviet republics of Germany. A French government led in exile by Pétain is installed in London. He will continue the fight still having the colonies under control and most of the fleet. There will be a, an uprising in the French colonies, solved in most cases with British help. However, the revolts in Algeria and Indochina will be difficult to put down. In the Vietnamese province of Nha Tinh start a series of uprisings, brutally suppressed by the overwhelming military strength of the French, Indian and Australian troops. After the fall of the Netherlands, the new communist government concede the independence to Indonesia, not recognized by the Allied and by the Dutch forces in Indonesia. A revolt starts. Communists and nationalists form an alliance. Munawar Musso returns from his Moscow exile leading the revolt. Disorders will continue until the end of the war. The Royal Navy tightened the blockade, but you can blockade a nation, not a continent. Soviet supplies keep coming into Germany, who now has the resources of France too, and the manpower they can rise up from the occupied countries. The naval blockade is largely ineffective. The victory in the West results in a wave of euphoria among the German population and a rising support for the communist governments in the whole Europe. Winners always have a lot of charm. At this point, the two Red Brothers are unstoppable. In July, Romania is invaded. A revolutionary committee led by George Christescu seizes the power. Transylvania returns to Hungary. Moldavia becomes a Soviet Republic. Italy invades Albania in June 1930. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia is invaded in October 1930. There was widespread discontent in Yugoslavia since 1929 when King Alexander created a centralized state. The invaders are helped by the communist guerrilla. One of their leaders is Joseph Broz, better known as Tito. Yugoslavia is dissolved. Greece is invaded in November. Greece is a traditional British ally, and there is the risk that, as happened in World War I, they join the war as soon as the wind changes. Crete remains in Allied hands thanks to a British landing. In 1930, there are no paratroopers. Only the Soviets have paratroopers, but not large units. The Soviets attacks Finland in March 1930. In August 1930, the Germans invade Denmark to prevent a British landing. Then the invasion of Norway starts. Merchant ships are used to land troops in South Norway. All available German submarines are in the Norwegian waters to aid in the operation. The Volksmarine in 1930 has around 50 submarines. The Germany's premier U-boat is a modification of the type UG. It's very advanced for its time. The screws exited the hole through the center line, much like modern-day submarines, resulting in a very low drag hole and excellent maneuverability. The Norwegian soldiers with old weapons are unable to turn back the sheer numbers of the Germans. From Norway, the German can support the Soviets against Finland. In November, a Finnish communist government is established in Helsinki. The German and Soviet combined forces invade Sweden. Sweden's military is small compared to the two Red Armies. The Swedish mines of iron ore are destroyed blowing up all major tunnels, all shafts, and then flooding the mine. Best case scenario, two years before the mine is back in operation. However, after the conquest of France, the Swedish ore is no more vital for the German industry. The Soviets invade Persia in January 1931 with three armies. The conquest is rapid. The Red Army numerically outmatched the Iranian forces. The British enter Persia from Iraq. 
but they only have two Indian divisions and few mechanized brigades. The Russians size Abadan, one of the world's largest oil refineries. However, due to bad roads and bad logistics, they fail the main target of the operation, India and Middle East. Liebknecht and Tagliati were not so keen on an invasion of Switzerland. There is little strategic gain in conquering Switzerland, while a coastly alpine war might well have ensued in their already stretched armies. But Trotsky insisted that the revolution must be global. Eleven German divisions, two French communist brigade, and 15 Italian divisions, with somewhere 500,000 men, enter Switzerland in March 1931. The Swiss Army Corps retreats to the Alpine fortress known as the Redwit National. A provisional government is established in Basel. Soviet committees supervised by the Rote Armee takes over the administration of towns. In 1931, Europe is full red. Turkey remains neutral and try to bargain between allies and common turn. Spain and Portugal do not go to war, despite good relationships with the communist bloc. They are too weak after the civil war. In the Far East, the Japanese are able to occupy Shanghai, Canton, and Hainan. The resources they need are supplied by British colonies in the USA. The Japanese Empire has the first Type 89 tanks, 12 tons, and a 57mm gun. Indian. Canadian, New Zealand, and Australian troops are sent to this front. The Chinese retreat from coastal town as they cannot match the Japanese Navy, supported by the Royal Navy. But in Manchuria, the Japanese are defeated by the Soviets at Lake Kasan, near Vladivostok. Chinese and Soviet forces advance towards Korea. The Italians lose their colonies soon. The communist Italian government has not even the will to defend the colonies. Moreover, almost useless as Eritrea, Somalia, and Libya. By taking them, the Allies do the Italians a favor. There is a small-scale air battle of Britain, where Germans and British exchange air raids. The bombing campaign is largely ineffective. There is the need of specialized target-finding equipment, like the British GEE, H2S, and OBOE for hitting cities. This technology isn't available in 1930. Most of the bombs fall on private property, killing mainly civilians and cows. The American leaders see the two Red Brothers as the bad guys. They are vilified by the American government, akin to the denouncement of the Third Reich in our timeline. They are more afraid of communism than fascism. Fascism still keeps capitalism. Large American companies have always been able to do business with them, but communism is something alien. The public opinion is reluctant to engage in another land conflict on a far continent, but they know how to make them change their ideals. Since January of 1931, there were several anarchist bombings in the USA. Newspapers talk every day about the an imminent conflict with the Soviet Union and show evidence of Bolshevist propaganda targeting America's black community, the last one not entirely a fabrication of the press. Communists are put into a concentration camp at Camp Upton in New York, or are deported to a penal camp along the Yukon River. Mass meetings are prohibited, general strikes become a crime. The police mount machine guns on automobiles. Hardware stores sell their stocks of guns. On May 1, 1931, there are multiple large demonstrations and violence sparks during the normally peaceful parades in Boston, New York, and Cleveland. In the night, there is an arson attack on the U.S. Congress. In the next days, there are mass arrests of communists, especially of foreigners. Then, on May 5th, the American president, Herbert Hoover, announces the declaration of war on the Red Powers. The USA enters the war. The infusion of fresh US troops strengthens the British strategic position and boosts morale. American banks grant huge loans to Britain, funds that are used to buy munitions, raw materials, and food from the USA. 
American soldiers land in Britain. In spring of 1932, they arrive at the rate of 10,000 men a day. In the Far East, the arrival of American troops at the end of 1931 allows the Japanese to stop the Soviets at the gates of Seoul in Korea. During 1932, the USA drafts 5 million men into military service, with about 1 million US soldiers having arrived in Britain. However, Germany alone in this situation would have mobilized about one-third of their male population, between the ages of 20 and 45, bringing the strength of its armed forces near 10 million men. By the middle of 1932, the situation in Europe is stalled. The Reds have no navy to invade Britain, but the Allied have no way of face up with a gigantic amount of troops the Reds can muster in Europe. New, more reliable tanks are developed as the German Panzer II, the Panzer 35, the Soviet BT series, the multi turreted T 28. The T 26 has the role the T 34 had in our timeline, with more than 10,000 units manufactured. USA developed the T 2 medium tank, 14 tons with a 47 millimeter gun. The British have now the medium Mark III. The battle in the Atlantic with the sinking of Allied merchant ships by German U-boat continues. The air bombings over the cities becomes more intense, with new generations of more advanced bombers. Wars always cause rapid progresses in technology. There are the first Wunderwaffe weapons. The German scientists, with the collaboration of the Soviets and the Italian Enrico Fermi, starts to theorize a new powerful bomb. The fighting on the field in Europe is over, but the situation is not quiet. Europe is devastated. Two world wars in 15 years brought famine, revolts. In Britain, food and other essential items are scarce. Italy is on the verge of a civil war. Right movements are rising. The European countries occupied by the communist forces must be adequately patrolled and controlled since the communist government installed are often not well accepted by the population. Switzerland is not even fully conquered. Their army still resists in the mountains. Sweden and Yugoslavia are large nations with sparsely population, ideal for partisan groups. Anti-communist guerrilla is strong in Greece, Poland, Spain. This causes a significant drain of resources. Germany in the last years has become more autocratic and oppressive. To maximize the investments in war industry, the proportion of wealth going to people is reduced almost to subsistence levels, and often even below. Only absolute terror intimidates people enough to accept extreme economic privations. In USA, and especially in Britain, the leaders continue to fear a communist uprising. Their economies never recover from Great Depression, and people living in bad economic situation might support communism. Every worker and farmer in their own country is a potential communist. The labor disputes are often solved in favor of improvements for workers, while the strikes and anti-war speeches suffer violent attacks and both legal and illegal suppression. The desire of independence of India is rising, with the increasing risk of a revolt. USA in 1930 is not the superpower capable to win the war alone. After the fall of France, UK has no strong allied, and the losses for U-boat are raising. November 1932, there is a truce. The Germans accept to retire their armies from the West and stop the war in the Atlantic in exchange of the removal of the naval blockade. This marks the end of the World War. The Second World War left the East in communist hands, as in our timeline, and a devastated continent, as in our timeline again. Difficult to know the exact number of the death. In absence of great battles and bombing of cities, the death are a few million, but nobody knows how many mass graves, like Caton, have been excavated throughout the communist empire, and no one will count how many people have died for starvation, illness, and violence away from the battlefield. 
the war spending in America had as consequence to lift the American industry out of the Great Depression. Hoover will win the re-election in 1932, with the media controlled by anti-communist FBI censors supporting Hoover. By 1934, Democrats take the Congress. The Japanese continues their endless war with China. With America and Japan working together in the war, there is a stronger relationship and more American acceptance of Japanese actions in China. Korea is split in half, with North Korea under Soviet influence. India will become independent in the next years. South America was only sided by communism. They were never even remotely close to a revolution. Without a clear victory, the European economic development stalled, and the end of military spending, rather than freeing industry, shut it down, as there is no system to distribute commercial goods to the people, and they had no real currency to purchase it anyway. France and Italy collapse. Pétain enters Paris after a few months after the truce, welcomed as a hero. In the Kingdom of Italy, Togliatti is placed under arrest, and a new government established, putting an end to the communist rule. In spring 1933, Liebknecht is replaced by Thälmann, soon after Stalin becomes the first secretary of Soviet Union. The two leaders abandon the cause of the international revolution. Stalin and Thälmann's policy is socialism in one country, to strengthen socialism within their country rather than globally. There are the first divergences between the two, about the influence on Balkans. The first Burgess, even whom Stalin suspects are too much pro-German, are targeted. In Germany, the war put strain on the already ruined economy. The Germans suffered also huge losses in the numerous liberation military campaigns. The inflation is rampant and the wage increases fail to keep up with the cost of living causing the workers to frequently grumble about their conditions. Germany had somewhat of an educated middle class who had only recently experienced the poverty. Indeed, communism was never fully supported by the population of Germany. August 1934, there is a military coup organized by the never completely disappeared Prussian military elite. After a brief civil war, Tillman is arrested ending the communist regime in Germany. A new leader with dictatorship power rises. Guess who?